Hello and welcome to RPG Design Talk, the fourth installment of RPG Design Talk. Today we are joined by uh, John Torres, the basic expert, that I'm sure of, of many of you are familiar with his uh, YouTube channel. Many of you are probably familiar with his content. John did put out many games already, uh, notably, well, a few games uh, and many adventure, notably uh, Cow Punchers, which I mm -hmm. like quite a bit, Atomic Punk. Uh, soon he's going to come out with uh, Macquitil. Which, yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> which used to be called uh, Obsidian and Blood, but got renamed to uh, Macquitel. Yeah, and he also put out some adventure. He got his zin. John's also an illustrator that made uh, illustration for like a uh, art for a RPG game, not to be like Mongoose Traveler, Call of mm. Tulu, uh, The Expanse. And so we can also talk uh, about that a bit uh, later on. So I think it's going to be a very interesting talk. Thank you, Johns, for uh, joining me today. Uh, thanks been? for having me on. I'm doing well. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Thank you. One thing I always uh, like to ask people I receive is about the their impetus for creation. What makes you decide, like, at some point, like, you were into the OB, and at some point you say, you know what? I want to put my own stuff out there. I want to. Hmm. I don't know. I mean... Ever since I was like in junior high, I've been interested in like uh, game design. Um, I was always into like uh, like card games uh, when I was younger and stuff like that. Like when the Lord of the Rings films came out, um, I was playing the TCG based off that, and I played a little bit of Magic. And I loved board games, so I was always into board game design, like making my own games. I never went anywhere, but I got pleasure from from making board games. And uh, then I found role playing. I found role playing games and uh, dive or dove into that. And after running games for about 10, 11 years, I was like, you know, I, I feel like I want to make my own thing. You know, like every I feel like every GM gets to that point where they're like, uh, you know, I, I think I could make something, too. And so then that's that's when I uh, that's when I started doing it and um, made a. Uh, Cow punchers. I made an original, like it was like a zine length game. It was really short and people seemed to like it. So I wanted to expand on that and make a, a bigger game that was a little more detailed. Um, jokingly in my head, I called it like advanced cow punchers. <laughs> uh, and so they kind of took off from there. And, you know, I, I've, 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 I love, uh, I love designing things. I just love creating things. So I think it's just, it just comes from a, I, I get joy out of the, the design part, I guess. It's uh, you said that uh, every GM at some point uh, dream of putting a, a, his own stuff out there, and I think that's very true. At least for probably after GM, maybe even maybe even more. And that is why I make those talk because I always have a lot of respect for people that actually made the step and did put something out. And that's the the goal of this this uh, those those talk I'm gonna make is like to give tips and tips to uh, people that to put stuff out. What is the do you want to expand a bit about the attraction of like game design? Like, because I I can relate to that uh, quite a bit, but I'd like to have your take on that. Like, what do you is it like the playing with the mechanics, thinking of how the feeling you would get from those uh, changing stuff around? Um, I I don't know. I, role playing games are unique in that you know they they arise they arise differently or they they function differently than like a board game or a card game, and I was always into designing. So when I started playing D and D, which is what I started with, I, I realized like, this is a game where I can, I can put a, a monster in, like I can design a monster myself and like put it in my campaign. And I feel like that's where a lot of people start. And you realize that's a lot of fun. My players fought that, like it worked. And then you start adding more stuff. Maybe you homebrew some classes. Um, maybe it, you, you, 
homebrew some spells or something like that. It always starts small with people like that. And I just realized, like, I really love this. I really enjoy this. But there's obviously things with, like, D&D that you can't do. Um, I know some people want to shoehorn D&D into everything or, like, every genre into D&D. I am not of that school of thought. That's why um, Cowpunchers is a different system. It's not D&D at all. You know, it's a dice mm -hmm. pool, success, failure, simple system. Um, because you you realize sort of like, I want to do this thing. I want to achieve this effect at the table. I want to achieve this um, feeling, this setting. And you realize, well, the game I've been playing in for years isn't adequate for that. I should make something else. I should look for something or I should make something else. And that's, to me, where the, the joy of it. And when you find something, I think that, like, no one's done really before or yet. Like, people told me I was crazy for doing, like, a hard Western game, right? No, not Weird West. But I was like, there's not very much of that out there. Like, there's um, there's Boot Hill. Uh, and then I, I'm just blanking on the other game, like, uh, Aces something. I forget what it's called. Um, I'll, I'm going to get roasted for that, but... <laughs> like I, I know which one. Like uh, I can't I mean, remember. Is this an eight? Is this an eight? But it's not that. Is that? that I, think is that eight, that? I think it's aces and eights. Okay. I think, that, yeah. I think that's what it is. There's not much out there that's like a hard Western game. So I was like, well, this is something that like I, I could make that no one has really done before, and I see a, um, a spot there, and it's something I care about. Like I loved westerns growing up. Mm -hmm. um, I still do. And so, you know, I, I just tried to to make something that I would want to play. And uh, that's, that's for me, like, always the starting point for when I design something is, like, I want to make the game that I want to play. Mm. So The Doodle Squatch was asking, does Cost Puncher use your 2D10 system? And, of course, I know the answer to that. But <laughs> And you talk about that a bit. And this uh, also leads to something like, uh, because, no, it's uh, its own dice pool system. But it, this is a... Uh, something I wanted to ask about, like why, because now you did make your own system that is a dice pool system for a uh, cow puncher. You did make a different system, which with for atomic pong, that is the 2d10 system. Mm -hmm. And you're going with BX for a uh, Makoto. Uh, yeah. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, more white box, like more OD and D oh, white but, box. You know, it's all, it's all in the same family. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> So, um, so what I wanted to know about that exactly, exactly like you said that oh, this system is limiting me. I cannot do what I want to do with this system, or how do you go about with that? Like, how do you choose? Like, uh, what did you feel was limiting with? Uh, because at some point, you, at, at first, you started with uh, some kind of like OD and your BX for cow puncher as well, right? Yeah. Um, so, like when I started designing, like I wanted to jump on the OSR uh, bandwagon because I love the OSR. I love old school games, and you see other people hacking BX or AD&D or od &D to be certain things. And you're like, oh, I want to do that too. But as I was writing a cowboy game uh, with like a BX undertone, I was, I got like four or five pages in, I was trying to make like classes work. And I realized this doesn't work like this. Maybe it's a mental block for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was just real. I realized I, I felt like I was fighting the BX system to make the game that I wanted to make. Like I was changing too much. I was, and that's when I realized, like, I think I need to go for, like, a skill-based game. Like, it needs to be a skill-based system. And it probably needs to be e a little simpler in a lot of respects than mm. than BX. Like, maybe a little more cinematic. Because it's, you know, we, we think of Western films and stuff like that. Like, D&D &D is good for delving in a dungeon. But it's not necessarily, in my mind, like a cinematic game, you know. Mm. Um, I mean, it can be, but uh, it's not it's it's more of a simulationist sort of thing in my mind and so i i had to that's when i made the decision like this isn't working and designing uh cow punchers i need to i need to make my own system and that's what i did so and then for atomic punk it was the same thing that was originally released as like a very much bx clone because that is a game where you're kind of delving into ancient or you're in the post-apocalypse and there's like ruins and stuff and you're exploring them and looking for loot and scavenging and stuff like that so the DD rules will work well for that sort of thing because DD, i've talked about this before in my opinion is is oftentimes a, a post-apocalyptic um, kind of game mm -hmm. and uh but but i'm also a fan of traveler and so then when the ogl stuff happened i was like you know i really kind of want to make the game that i really wanted to make and the osr 
oftentimes is very limiting where like I have to stick to the D20, you know, I have to stick to these, these certain things in order to, to be considered um, quote OSR. But I like, I love classic traveler. I love the, the pyramid of, you know, the probability distribution of a pyramid that like two dice give, I think mm -hmm. it makes for an interesting mechanic or like bell curves if you're using three dice. And so I was like, 2D10 has a really nice spread and uh, using fast, deadly combat that's similar to Traveler, but on 2D10 using like an attack matrix and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that That is really the kind of game I want to play in a post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic setting. So I went with that. And then with Makuhito, it's like, it, it's very sword and sorcery. And that's what D&D is like really good at, you know, like the, the Aztec world and mythology is like really well suited towards this grim dark and gritty sword and sorcery thing and uh that's why I, I went with that there so it's to me like i've talked about this a lot on my channel and on twitter a system and rules inform setting and mm -hmm. if you, you the, the setting will often fight against the rules or vice versa in my opinion yeah, I absolutely agree. And also want to say like with Car Puncher, I think you really nailed it with for the cinematic cinematic feel with this a little bit like faster action, like like with the not getting bogged down in the details, like the thing mm -hmm. like I think you did a very good job at it. Thank you. And um so and this is something also often asked, like when you approach a new project, like what is the first kind of stepping stone? For you, I guess it'd be like team or setting. You you choose something you want to do and then you adapt the rules for to, to fit something like that's what seemed to be your approach right sure yeah like if i if i wanted to do like um i don't know like let's say i wanted to make a a, a role-playing game that was based on like uh like an anime like anime style like battle manga kind of thing or it's very high powered and stuff like that i probably wouldn't use osr rules mm -hmm. i'd either probably like make my own or I'd look for something out there that has like a license already that I could design for. I, I'm going to try and find us uh, if I'm, if I'm starting from that perspective, which I usually do, which is I want to make a game in this theme or setting um, or this feel, I'm going to try and find a rule set or make a rule set. That's going to best express that um, at least in my own opinion uh, or, or, or way of doing that, because I'm, I'm just not a fan of like shoehorning different, this, the, the same thing into, the same rule set over and over again. Like I'm not interested in rewriting BX over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't interest me. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad. I'm glad uh, you approaching this way because I'm always like glad to see new system because, I, like you said, I totally agree that like the rules in like in, inform the setting and the feel of a game. And I think when everybody tried to shoehorn everything in the same system, well, then they all kind of feel samey a bit. Yeah. What does uh, uh what sorry good well so I, i've said this in my recent like uh, article i posted about the osr like i'm not mm -hmm. interested in remaking bx over and over again because i become like acutely aware that i'm still just playing bx or i'm still mm -hmm. just playing ad and d like okay we're playing like uh, sci-fi you know in space but like we're rolling a d20 you, you're doing saving throws that are very they're just all it's all just reskin D D, and it becomes for me kind of boring like it's distracting as a gm and as a player because I'm just so acutely aware that I'm still playing D and D, even though it's a different IP or setting or something like that. Like in my head, I'm like, well, this is, I'm still playing D and D. <laughs> I want to play something else, you know? So when are you, uh, when you approach a new setting, how do you, uh, well, first, what makes a setting appealing to you? And also why do you, how do you get to the step of like, determining what is the feel you want, what the setting evoke, what you're like, there, there must be some, uh, a time of reflection. We try to break down the trope and, um, uh, the feel you're going for after. Yeah. Um, for picking a setting, it's always just things that I care about. Like I have fond memories of sitting in my grandparents' living room. That's like hazy smoke everywhere. Cause they were hardcore, like chain smokers. <laughs> And watching like John Wayne Westerns on their TV, which was like the old TV, like the tube TV that was like the wooden, it was like a mm -hmm. piece of furniture, you know. Yeah. And my grandpa's like passed out on the recliner back there with like a cigarette in his hand, super dangerous. <laughs> and, you know, I'm just sitting there watching movies with my grandparents, you know, and like I have, I have memories of that that are like, that are formative for me. And, uh, you know, that, that, 
to me, like you have to pick things like that for me, at least that I'm really passionate about that I care about mm -hmm. because I think that the passion kind of shows through in, instead of just like, Oh, well, you know, I don't know, this, this setting is really popular. I'm, I'm going to try and like make something for it. Um, you know, that I think people can kind of eventually, I think they'll see the authenticity in the product one way or another, you know, mm -hmm. and I always want my things to feel um, like I care about what I'm making. <laughs> like even if there's mistakes and typos, which I'm sure there, there always are, like Atomic Punk is full of them. And Cow Punchers, despite, you know, getting a Raven to edit them is full of them. Because, you know, we're, it's a small time indie thing. But like if the passion and the, and the, the care comes through, then I, I feel like that's, that's what my goal is. Because th I feel like that will show that I'm trying to make the best thing that I can. And, and I think people appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So it has to come down to being picking something I'm passionate about. Like I love the Fallout games. I played tons of Fallout 1 as a kid, and, you know, um, on my crappy little like Windows PC as a kid. Uh, Fallout 1 was a, a big part of like getting me into RPGs as well. You know, I, I was I'm of that generation where like I played PC RPGs before I got to pen and paper because mm -hmm. that was just more accessible for me. And I grew up in a very evangelical home that was very uh hostile during this after the post satanic panic towards anything that was perceived um satanic so you know uh i compete pc games for me led to to computer games so that's where atomic punk comes from and then makuhito is just me uh looking at my own culture and heritage that you know back to my ancestors you know uh, mm -hmm. they've always fascinated me uh, it's not a it's not a setting I'd want to live in. Um, I'm glad the <laughs> other half of my ancestors won, but it's still it's still super interesting, you know. And I, I think it makes for a cool game that nobody's really. There's a uh, uh, was it Maslan uh, from the TSR tried to do, but that's about it, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm always trying to pick things that I'm passionate about that I haven't seen other people really attempt. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 true. It's the thing that it's not a not has been a explored a lot. And I find it very interesting because, like, a lot of people like uh, say that. Oh, and a lot of people like maybe on more on, that would be more on the left. So we tired of always like European kind of fantasy. Now you got somebody here that come and uh, yeah. I don't know if they're <laughs> gonna be satisfied with what you bring to the table. No, uh, <laughs> I've already I've already gotten some hate. Someone on Twitter was coming at me because I, I'm gonna Makuhito is gonna just be Aztec only, but I'm mm -hmm. not like sugarcoating anything. You know, mm -hmm. like the game's brutal. Like their society was brutal. Um, and it was not a society I want to live in or endorse at all. But, mm. you know, it makes for an interesting adventure setting, uh, certainly. And uh, I want to do a supplement where, you know, um, Cortez lands and, you know, the, the conflict ensues between uh, the conquistadors and the and the Mexica people. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I already took crap on Twitter about it because they were saying, like, I wasn't going to make the Aztecs the heroes. And I'm like, but they they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to present it in a historical way. That's just like, mm. this is what happened and you can run a game in it. Like, that's my goal. I'm not trying to send a message. I'm just saying, here's an interesting point in history adventure in it. So, <laughs> yeah. And it's also like people forget like that. Yeah. The Aztec, the Spaniard came and displaced the Aztec, but the Aztec was also an empire that subjugated a lot of people. And a lot of those people sided with Spanish because they were tired of the Aztec. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Aztecs were, they were, uh, people were chafing under their rules. So when they mm -hmm. saw a bunch of guys with uh, better equipment land, they're like, hey, you know, maybe we can finally beat these guys that have been oppressing us for like 200, 300 years. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. we're kind of sick of it. <laughs> you mentioned uh, just a bit earlier that you wasn't interested, were interested in uh, always remaking BX. But you are very, like, a, I would say, an OS, OSR gamer, like an old school gamer. Mm -hmm. What in your opinion, makes a game old school? Because even if you have a new game, it can still be at least old school in feel or in presentation. What is what is it that make that would classify a game as being like, or a vintage game? So I see people that use the term nowadays. Yeah, you know, I was on uh, Diversity and Dragon stream and I wrote, again, that article um, mm -hmm. and I made a video uh, kind of talking about it a little bit and... You know, in my own mental classification, there's like classic or classical gaming. And that's like, I'm going to play Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. I'm going to play original Dungeons & Dragons. I'm going to play Classic Traveler, WEG, Star Wars, D6. I'm going to play, um, I'm going to play one of those games. And 
I'm going to, th that, that's cool. And I think that's great. And that's also old school. And then there's people that make new stuff. And I do this too, where mm -hmm. you're kind of either uh, cloning something or uh, you're taking something and making something new. And like you said, it has the aesthetic or the, the feeling of, of old school, like it evokes it, you know, whether that's lethality, uh, whether that's the feeling of exploration or the emergent story aspects of like old school game, whatever that may be, like it leans into one of those things. Um, I, I would, in my mind, I classify that as like neoclassical. Um, and yeah, I've seen people throw on the vintage thing. I, I put it in the Atomic Punk 2D10 book because it's it's not a, necessarily even a BX clone anymore. It's its own thing at this point. So like, is it OSR? I don't know. Is it is it old school? Yes, I think it is because it mm -hmm. it's definitely being in, influenced by like white box and classic traveler in a lot of ways. So, and and you're gonna die pretty quick in in the two D ten atomic bunk. It's pretty deadly. So, yeah. Know, I, so you, you think that would be like a big part of like the feel would be like lethality? Uh, I don't. I know a lot of people like talk about challenging the players, not only like the yeah. Characters. Yeah. Yeah, you're, it's it's player skill, um, you know, like Gygax and and this, you know, talks about how mm -hmm. players might be confused about the rules, but like as their character levels up, they are going to, um, um, they're they're going to become better players as well as they, like their characters are are advancing in level, but they're also advancing in level as players and becoming more veteran players as well as they mm -hmm. learn the rules and discover things. So uh, I think that that is. Um, an important part of, of it is like the discovery part of the players. It's it's not just like the adventure aspect, but it's the discovery aspect of of uh, of that as well. Discovering the rules almost too. But yeah. I would say like yeah, high, high lethality. Um, and um, I don't I don't know. It's one of those things where like you kind of feel it when you see it. I think so. Mm. And I guess you, since you mentioned like uh, that you always always interesting in game design from when you were playing board game and stuff like that, and you wrote your own system twice. Now, I guess like the role, the rule discovery when you approach a new game must be something that you're into as well, like learning the new rules, learning how they function, learning how they inform the feel of a game. That yeah, you, you, you're always trying. To, I mean, there's only so many ways of like rolling math rocks and using it as a resolution method for figuring out if something happens or not or what happens mm -hmm. but um but it it is fun when you think about something because again I, I approach it from like a setting perspective where i i'm like okay i'm going for this and is like d20 gonna be like the right way of doing that and uh, oftentimes it's not so that is the fun part for me is like discovering like, well, what if I do this, you know, and, and I'm obviously influenced by other games. Um, I, you got to steal like an artist in a lot of respects, you know, in, in order to, to, but it's a matter of like, how do you take different ingredients and mix them all together and make something that's like coherent, that's, that all flows together and, um, you know, feels like it's, it's its own, own thing and not just a clone that's why i'm not interested in making bx repeatedly over and mm -hmm. over again that's boring to me so I, I need to be constantly engaged to someone creating something um in order to to f keep doing what i want to do because as soon as i get bored as soon as i'm just like shilling crap out just for the sake of shilling crap out then i don't know i think i'm done at that point <laughs> I want to say uh, people in the chat, uh, well, uh, thank them for joining first. And also, if you have questions for John that you want to ask, feel free to uh, put them. I'm going to try to put them on screen and ask uh, John when they're, when when the time comes. Uh, I wanted to ask, why, how do you proceed when you approach a new project? When you do you are you the, the, the kind of guy that's going to make an outline and you do those things, or you just go like you, you start from the, the top and you slowly work your way through? Do you? plan a lot or you just go with the feel um when i when i start something like i i usually have to like brainstorm it so i will start with like a list i usually make a a wants list like a, a needs and wants list like mm -hmm. if i'm doing this project and it's going for this feel it needs to do these things and i'll make a list like maybe i'll put like for cow punchers i made a list and it was like it needs to be cinematic it needs to be lethal it needs to be fast it needs to feel like gunfights need to be fast you know 
um uh it need because it needs to feel like the movies you know when you draw your pistol bam 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 you fan the gun and it's done combat's done you know i wanted i was like i made a list of stuff like that and that's when i was realizing like well bx just isn't going to work for this because you know it's, it just it's not hitting any of these things so for me like making a list of like my wants that i i feel like whatever i'm trying to achieve these are the things that it needs to hit it needs to touch on uh, I, I generally make a list of, of it needs to hit these things, whatever mechanics those may be, um, whatever, whatever, whatever feeling it needs to hit. Um, and then I, I build mechanics around those if I'm creating a new system or, or designing something new or, or whatever. So. And when you build those mechanics, is there like a lot of back and forth? Do you like sometimes try something to do some tests with it? Doesn't work. Has to go back to drawing board. Do you, is is math involved a lot in your process? I, I'm terrible at math, so I'm a feels guy. You know, like um, I, I will sit at my desk here and I'll just roll. Like if I'm working on a mechanic, I'll just roll the the mechanic like hundreds and hundreds of times to kind of see what what patterns emerge and what it feels like. Uh, and I'll I'll run through that and you know, okay, well if the mechanic is this, and if I'm rolling two dice and uh, the target number is this, what's that going to feel like? And so I'll, I'll just roll repeatedly. Like, what does that feel like? Okay. That feels pretty good. Or that feels bad. I need to change it. Um, I do use like any dice sometimes, I to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, if you do want to do once I start to get a feel for it, I like to double check the probabilities and whatnot to make sure that it's sound. And, uh, any dice.com is a great website for doing that. If you're a mm -hmm. designer, you, sh you should use any dice.com. Um, it's fantastic, but I'll, I'll, I'll do a little bit of both, I guess, but I'm really much on like feel like how I'll, I'll, uh, I'll roll dice and see how does that feel like in atomic punk, the, I, I went kind of the classic traveler route where it was uh weapon versus armor type instead of, there's no AC. So like you're rolling mm -hmm. 2d10 and like, Oh, I'm, I'm using a plasma gun against metal armor. It's going to give me like a plus two, you know, uh, to hit because it's going to like melt the armor. Mm -hmm. I made that whole table. There was no real math involved with that. That table was made uh, pretty much like art. Uh, it was, it was like rolling dice and seeing what it feels like. Like I, I knew that a plasma gun needs to do extra damage against like a basic metal armor, but maybe against like nuclear powered, like atomic armor, it may maybe needs to not be as effective or something like that. So I would put in some modifiers on that chart. And I'd roll all of them, like all the weapons versus all the the armors, like hundreds of times. How did that feel? Uh, that that feels a little off. I need to tweak this one. This one needs to go up by a plus one or down by a plus one, or this needs to be a plus two. Or like that's how I made that table, and um, it was based purely on I'm go I'm going for this, and how does it feel? Until I got to a point where I was happy. It took a lot of work. There's probably easier, quicker ways if I wanted to go like super math nerd with it. But I like to create this way where it's going to, I'm already testing if it feels right as I'm like uh, picking these numbers and these modifiers and stuff like that, working on a mechanic. And are you, uh, when you when you make those tables and you make those notes, are you like a pencil and paper kind of guy? Or are you like, do you like Excel and what kind of a tool do you use to actually do the writing? Uh, I just write in Google Docs. <laughs> I just write in a Google Doc. Uh, and then when I'm done with everything, like I'll get it all written out, I transfer it over to Affinity because I do I do all my own layout. I do everything myself. So I do all the art, the writing, the layout, the sometimes the editing, which is a big no-no, but whatever. I'm, a, mm -hmm. I'm just a single guy doing it my, by myself. Um, but although Raven, again, helped me with Cowpunchers, which I'm very thankful for. But uh, I will I will do... I will put it into affinity and affinity is a great program for doing the layout yourself. It's mm -hmm. cheap. I think you can, it's usually on sale, like on various, like I got it half off for like 25 bucks. Normally it's like 50 or 60, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a one-time payment and you have like fantastic desktop publishing and mm -hmm. you can start publishing stuff and putting it on Lulu or uh, drive through RPG or anything like that. And you're going to have like really professional looking uh, stuff like that. So yeah. Affinity and, and Google and Google Docs is for the writing. I use Clip Studio Paint for art. So, yeah. Clips, yeah. Yeah, I like Clip Studio Paint. I like it better than Photoshop, personally. <laughs> Already? Yeah. 
Right. Because like that's a uh, we can go on that that subject as well because that's another part of what you do as well. Like you, because and I guess it's an advantage you have since you are an artist as well. You can do a lot of your own art yourself. You also did art for uh, other people. Mm -hmm. And since you can have like a bold perspective there, I can ask that. Like I wanted to ask, do you have any advice for game designer? when dealing with artists, like when approaching artists, when looking for somebody, when trying to have the work being done and done in a timely manner. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, artists need to be better. Like I'll say like uh, artists, we are lazy and we will drag our feet and we do need some motivation from time to time. Uh, I am very like uh, analytical when I approach my art. Like I didn't start out good at art. Um, when I started taking art seriously in 2012, I, I was doing crappy art. It would look like not good. It was not professional at all. And I spent two hours every day for like two or three years just studying art every day, doing figure drawing, like mm -hmm. nude figure drawing, uh, perspective drawing, still life stuff. Like I was just doing the basics, hammering the basics of art. So I was building up my skill set. And um, so it takes a lot of hard work. Find an artist. If you're looking for an artist, find an artist who looks like their style will match what you're trying to do. Um, and, you know, it, you're going to have to... Art is expensive, too. Like, that's just one thing. It takes a lot of work to to do art, uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to make an illustration. It can take me, like, an entire day or an entire week, depending on how complex it is, uh, to make an illustration for someone. And, um, you know... So it's going to cost money if you're, if you're going to pay an artist to do it. Um, if you are an artist, you don't necessarily have to be the best. But if you're not an asshole and you're easy to work with and you get stuff done on time, people mm -hmm. are going to hire you. Like you mm -hmm. can be kind of mediocre. You can be kind of you don't have to be a Frank Frazetta level. You know, um, you can be kind of you can be kind of amateurish still. And people, will, if you get it done and it looks good and you're not an asshole to work with, then people are going to hire you. So. Um, artists on that side should, should strive to be that and um yeah get your stuff done on time <laughs> yeah like, I, because I, I wanted to ask you the other side of question as well like advice for artists trying when they try to sell their art but i guess you kind of touched on that yeah. pretty well there i think it's an important point and also like i i got like an artistic background as well but like i wouldn't be able to work as an artist because i'm i am too slow mm. things like for me like doing a piece that i would be satisfied with like that, that would be decent. Just take me too time, too long, and that I think that's a big. I see you draw on stream sometimes, and I say, well, the speed is a is a big factor there. I think it's the tools we use too. Like if you're gonna freelance illustration, I know some people shit on it, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, digital art is gonna be your best friend. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just quicker, it's easier, it's it's less expensive. There's some upfront investment. You got to get a a Wacom Cintiq. I have a drawing tablet right here. You know that. Yep. is my uh, drawing tablet that I use. Mm -hmm. And it was expensive. And uh, Clip Studio Paint is like 50 bucks. But, um, you know, it, it's going to be your best friend because you're going to be able to hammer out stuff probably twice as fast as a traditional artist. Mm -hmm. And if you're using um, if you're using the right tools, if you're using the right brushes, like I love Clip Studio Paint because it really does, a, it's a good in-between between Photoshop and Corel Painter. Has yep. really good. It has really good brush simulation, but it is easier to use in Corel Painter. I get in Corel Painter and I'm like, I don't know what any of this crap is or what it means, and I'm trying to like adjust a brush and it doesn't work. And I just get mad and close it and open up Clip Studio Paint. And then Photoshop is just designed for photo editing, and they've kind of tried to move it towards being a painting software thing because so many concept artists use it, but it's still not where I want it. And the Creative Cloud is just a buggy mess. And I hate paying subscription fees. So for me, Clip Studio Paint is like a good middle ground where it has good brush simulation. The if you're doing black and white art, which a lot of you know old school products use, mm -hmm. the the vector line stuff in Clip Studio Paint is amazing for like doing black and white comic book style art. Mm -hmm. I use it, I use that a lot from a lot of my black and white art, and it looks fantastic. So um yeah, it's just it's just uh digital is gonna be your best friend. You can try and do traditional but that's going to take a lot of it's going to be uh, you're going to have to practice really hard to get fast at it because it's mm. going to traditional just eats up so much time yeah so. and uh, and 
it's time is money at some point and it's going to affect how much you need to charge for a piece i guess sure yeah and um oh we got a question there from uh somebody you might be familiar with <laughs> victor ask <laughs> your calls getting a raise uh, we already split the costs on Streamyard, buddy. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to go back to uh, the design a bit because you you sure. mentioned that you were gonna do a lot of testing on your own on the desk, but I know also that you mentioned in stream that you're doing play tests uh, with a group. Do you have like a real group that you do play tests? Do you send copy of the game to people that, to test while you're not there? And give you feedback afterward. How do you find people that want to test games? Because I know that's a big problem. Tester, like people, sometimes say, that, "Yeah, I'd be interested in being testing your game," but then you never get feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, I had that kind of trouble with Cow Punchers. So Cow Punchers, I tested it myself mm -hmm. um, with friends and stuff. But then I also let um, people on the channel. I made a video and said, "Like, I need your help. Like, if you want to, I made like a Google form so people could sign up and I could get their email." Mm -hmm. And um, I sent them the the rough draft of it and they play tested it for me. And some of them gave me feedback. Some of them did not. I did get good feedback from specific people. And I think them in the book, uh, Roy and Jerry Breeze were like fantastic. They gave me a lot of good feedback. Uh, as far as like going in the future, I play tested on, on the Gilded server that I started. So um, I'll just throw, it's a great place. Cause if you're wanting to design something or you want to play something, I'll, I'll just be like, Hey, I'm going to test this. Uh, who's interested in, in testing it out? We're going to do, we're going to test it this way. And, you know, you, I, I'll get like five or six people that are interested where our schedules sync up and uh, we'll, we'll run, we're running, like we're testing Makuhito right now and we're doing it like uh, every other Saturday. And so I'm running it like a West March style game. Uh, Jeff, I see Jeffro Johnson in the chat. He'll be happy to know I'm using one, one time. So uh, <laughs> uh, I kind of have to, cause I've, Keeping track of all these cal Aztec calendars is a nightmare because uh, it's mechanically important to the game. But um, yeah, you know, like I, I just kind of throw it out there, and uh, it it uh, people are willing to to try it. I mean, I think I have the benefit of having kind of a larger reach, and people are interested in what I'm doing. But um, I say, if you don't have that, just I mean, you got to have friends and family that might be interested in testing your game. Like, try and coax them into it. <laughs> so. Mm. Yeah, yeah, maybe also we can uh, send a shout out there, like for people that say they want to test the game. Like if you do, and if you do test, like do send some feedback. <laughs> yes, yes. It, yeah. You're if someone's taking the time to send you like this, like a uh, pre version of their game, and you mm -hmm. said you're going to test it, the least you could do is read it at least and get feedback. Yeah, and that's the that's the very least you could do. And because also, if that, you want the game to be good after, like I guess you're somewhat invested in the game if you wanted to uh, check it out before end. So if you want it to be good at the end your your input is important yeah and it'd be even better if you play tested it for them if they if you said you, you would and they sent it to you like <laughs> at least run one or two sessions and it gives some yeah. feedback <laughs> do you when you write sometime like what is your kind of discipline with writing because i know you also have young children do you have like do you try to keep to like if, if it was a regular job or you do like nine to five do you write when you have time do you and mm. how do you approach the actual like sitting there and doing the work? Um, I, I, I try and keep, uh, I, I just try and, and write when I can. Cause I, I, I'm home. I work from home. So I'm doing my freelance stuff and mm -hmm. my own stuff. And so my daughter, she's three, she'll be running around over here, like destroying things in the office here, uh, jumping on the, the guest bed and stuff like that. And generally being disruptive. So I just try and, and write when I can, sometimes while she's using me as a jungle gym. Um, <laughs> so it, it, I'm surprised I'm able to be as productive as I am. Somehow I find a way to do it. I think mm -hmm. it's a, again, goes back to picking stuff that you're passionate about. So if you're picking stuff that you're passionate about, you'll find time to, to write for it and be disciplined in it. You'll maximize your time. You'll, you'll be like, Oh, you know, I got, I got an hour to write or, or read or edit or something like that. I'm going to spend it doing that rather than like, scrolling on my phone or something like that so um yeah i i'm just i just sort of write when i can i probably should get a more disciplined schedule if i could but it's just hard with with a kid <laughs> because you're you're fairly productive you started like putting product not that not that long ago and you already like uh i 
good catalog that's building up, especially sure. with design and stuff like that. Do you think that the, your uh, background as a professional artist, as a freelance artist, helped in like in getting this discipline and getting the job done and sitting there? Even though if you don't feel like it, still doing it. Yeah, um, probably because I doing freelance art. Like when I would do stuff for uh, Mongoose Traveler, they'd send over here. Here's like 50 guns. We need you to illustrate 50 guns, and you're just for the equipment section or something like that. And um, you, you you're sort of like uh, <laughs> I don't want to draw 50 guns. Like you, you draw 10, and you're like uh, this is this is boring now. I want to do something else, mm -hmm. but I got 40 more to do, and this is what pays the bills. So um, you just kind of tough it out and do it. So learning to do creative things that you don't want to do will definitely probably help you get better at doing the creative things that you do want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you sort of exercise that creative muscle. If you're able to be creative when you're not feeling creative, uh, you, you have a valuable skill. And I'm not always able to do that. But when I do, I try and take advantage of that ability. Um, and it, it's super helpful. <laughs> You talk about like going through the thing that you feel boring to do and still going through that. Is there a part in writing a game that you kind of dread? Like some part, like you say, like, oh, you know what? This need to be in the game, but it's not my favorite part to write. I still need to blow through. Is, do you have like some, uh, do you have this uh, aspect there? Probably setting up tables in your layout software. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that's gets that gets boring. Uh, I, I can fast. see that. <laughs> Like uh, making making the table is kind of fun, but like because uh, I'll make it like in a in Google Docs or something in my in my rough in my my previous drafts, you know. So once the previous drafts are done and I feel like it's good, time to move to the final draft. Um, I'll I'll move it there. So setting it up, it's not that the software is hard, but like sometimes I I love tables, but also I regret when I when I get to the point where I'm doing the layout for the, making the tables, I'm sort of like, uh, what did I do to myself? Sort of thing. <laughs> Um, that that's kind of annoying. Also, uh, I also dread the part when it's time to send things to print on demand to like drive through RPG because mm -hmm. it's a, it's a nightmare. Oh my gosh, the back end if you're a creator on drive through RPG trying to set up your book mm -hmm. is just it's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. I hate it. Uh, do you at least Lulu gives you like a, pr a print a digital print preview of like what your book's going to look like and you can be like, oh, that looks like trash or it doesn't. <laughs> Drive through RPG is like no, uh, order a proof and then you can see if your book is garbage or not, and then you can and then once you get the book, like I, it's happened to me before. I have a copy of of uh, Cow Punchers that like uh, something was messed up in the formatting and there's just like big sp black squares all throughout the book. Whoa. It's completely unreadable and it did not look like that in my files, mm -hmm. but something happened and so I had to edit it and fix it. So it can get, it can get kind of obnoxious. The, the That's surprising you say that from drive through because like looking at their side, they seem to be on the top of a technology technological advancement uh -huh. there. Nah, man, the back end is like a GeoCity <laughs> site. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> the front end too. <laughs> <laughs> but in the in the design process itself, like is that like a part that you prefer and a part that you dread? Like is it like are you like 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 for me, like when I design like magic stuff and stuff like that, I, I'm not a magic guy, but sometimes it needs need to be done in game. So I always like drag my feet. Is there like some part of that you that you you're really excited about, and some part that you're ah, I need like character creation needs to be done, but let's get through it. I don't know. I, I kind of generally enjoy it all. It's it's more the the I like the creative part of it all. It's mm -hmm. I guess more the the putting it all together part, you know, it's the, it's the problem that I guess, you know, like Dave Arneson had where he was a big idea guy, mm -hmm. but he, he could not get his ideas on the paper um, yeah. as, as, as fluently as he needed to. Um, hence his relationship with, with Gary in a lot of respects. So, you know, I, I, I kind of, I, I kind of understand that perspective where it's fun to generate ideas. It's just the, the buckling down to do it. So. Yep. And uh, do you deal sometime with what we'd call like writer's block when you're like just staring at the screen or you're trying to you rewrite the same sentence over and over and like you you never satisfy from it? It doesn't like how do you deal with those kind of a uh, issue? Oh man, uh, yes, I do get blo writer's block. I do get like art block when I'm doing illustrations for my stuff or other people's stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I I generally just try and go outside, go touch some grass, you know, uh, go play with the kid. Uh, take her to the park or something like that. Um, 
but I'll I, I'll watch a movie, maybe listen to music. I try and do other things. Um, sometimes I'll pick up my guitar and strum a few chords, kind of get my brain going a little bit. Cause it, you, I have to get my, you get so focused, laser focused on something and then you start to miss, miss other things. I also have, have like multiple projects that I'm working on at, at a single time to keep my interest. Uh, and so like if one project is, has me at a block, I'll work on something else a little bit. Like if Makuhito is giving me trouble, I'll be like, well, you know, I got to work on my zine. So I'll work a little bit on the zine and that will feel pretty good. And then I can mm -hmm. go back to, to Makuhito and, and it'll feel, uh, it'll feel a lot better. So I, I can kind of get out of the rut. You, you, you sort of have to, as soon as I feel like I'm forcing something, I stop because I know whatever I'm about to create is going to be garbage hmm. uh, because I'm, I'm forcing it too hard. So I'll take 10, 15 minutes to get up and do something and then come back to it and maybe be refreshed because no, nothing is worse than um, being blocked and then trying to force it. I know I just said like trying to force through it is good, but part of it is again, stepping back for 10 minutes, yeah. collecting yourself and then, and then pushing forward. You need to kind of do that regroup. Uh, otherwise like uh, whatever you make is probably going to be bad and you're going to end up changing it in the future anyways. So <laughs> it's very interesting. Or your, your answer is different than the Miguel Ribeiro from the red room. And then answer was where, but he used to work as a journalist where he was really like getting through it. You would be more like a, try to step away and come back to it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned when you uh, work on your art that sometimes you also get like creator blocks. Do you, how, do you how, does, how is it different working on art for your own project versus working on art for other people's project? What do you find like it's harder? Are you more critical when it's your own stuff? Or you do you, or do you tend to uh, procrastinate more? Mm, I don't know. It it's 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 maybe about the same sometimes like right now in uh in Bakuhito, I'm, I'm in the monster section like doing illustrations for all the monsters mm -hmm. from like aztec myth and, and some like regular animals and stuff like that and i've elected to do all the illustrations in the style of like the the codices how they're kind of yep. like very simple kind of illustrations because mm -hmm. I, I just think that looks so cool it'll look like a like very a codice classic. Yeah, it's on theme. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm i focused on that goal, but like, man, it's it's pretty an annoying to, it's because it's outside of my normal style. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's kind of annoying to get to that point and be like, okay, I'm going to draw another like vellum medieval version of, uh, of, of some Aztec monster or like of a, what does a jaguar look like, but in that style. Mm -hmm. um, so it can get pretty monotonous. And like I said, working for other people, sometimes they... They like critique things, um, and it's it's you're, they're like I want this, but then I also want this completely contradictory thing in the art. You know that's not going to work, and you have to sort of explain and rein them in sometimes, and be like, "What you're asking mm -hmm. is absurd. <laughs> you don't know what you're asking for." Yeah, uh, you know. So it's it, 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 I don't know. It, th there's pros and cons to both, I guess. The hard part when you're doing it for yourself is keeping yourself motivated. Like I'll, I'll fall behind on my own illustrations and, and be like, okay, I gotta, I gotta buckle down and spend the next few days, um, uh, working on my stuff because I procrastinated a bit too much, you know. So when uh, John the artist has John as a boss, is he is John as a boss a good boss? <laughs> <laughs> you mean like a boss you... of myself or? Yeah. Um, I can be. I, I can be pretty hard on myself. Like I have some illustrations in in my current uh, book that I should probably go back and do, redo. They're probably mm -hmm. fine to anyone else that looks at those pictures. Like, oh, that looks great, dude. It looks fine. But for me personally, I'm like, no, it's terrible. It's ter it's. I'm ashamed that I drew that. Like, it's ter it, throw it away. It's, it's god awful. Uh, so I'm probably a little harsh on myself a lot of the time because um, I can see all the mistakes I make, and generally other people they're not looking at the the at those things because they weren't part of that creative process but um but sometimes I'm, I'm too lenient too so I, I don't know it kind of i get lazy and i'm like ah, it's good enough you know and then i regret it later but when you work on a illustration for a for one of your own project do you do one illustration all the way until you it's done and you're happy with it or you do bring it to some level work on something else some level come back to the first one do you, do you kind of work in parallel or is it really like work in series 
Um, work in series, probably. I, I'll start with mm -hmm. a sketch and I'll work it up. I've been doing a lot of black and white art lately, a lot of pen and ink, mm -hmm. uh, digital inking and, and whatnot. So I can work pretty fast in that. And um, so I, I, I'm generally able to go start to finish on an illustration in like a day or two, depending on the size and its complexity. If it's a mm -hmm. little short, if it's a little like, you know, flavor illustration that's going to go on the corner of the page, I can get that done in maybe like an hour or two, if that. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, people will see me on stream. You know, I, I sometimes yep. if I if I feel good about it, I can get a whole illustration done in like a two hour stream. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. It's... Yeah, I've seen that, and like I said, like, I always find like that impressive <laughs> because I know the work that goes into it, and I know like all like it would take me forever to do. You with Marquito and also with the uh, cow puncher. I guess less with Atomic Punk, but like Cow Puncher had a lot of research into it as a, because like it's almost, and I didn't check it myself because like I, I, I like guns, but I'm not like the biggest gun guy, but there's a lot of information about gun, about the years they came out. Mm -hmm. And I guess Makoto also is going to have like a lot of uh, historical research done into it. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you approach this? Uh, is, is this some, and is that something that you actually enjoy doing like this? deep dive into getting informed of the period you're going to depict i i think it is i i do enjoy um i i do enjoy the research part because it's it's all like world building it's all uh you're all you're, you're researching to generate ideas for a game and so to me that's a, like that, that's a lot of fun uh for, for cow punchers yeah i went full gun artist on <laughs> on everything because i it would bother me in my play group if we're playing like in 19 uh, in 1862 and you have this pistol that shouldn't exist in 1862 that would just bother me like i don't mm -hmm. that, that that shouldn't happen so i went through and i was like i'm gonna i'm gonna stat out like every gun from what did i i think i did 1840 to 1899 i did like as many pistols rifles and shotguns as i could mm. uh because the gun I, i'm a gun owner i'm and everything so you know i know a thing or two and mm -hmm. so the, the gun artist in me was just like i can't I can't skimp on that. And it ended up being a pretty big portion of the book, which is funny, but um, I, I felt it, that was important, you know, but for, it's no, it's no bigger than the, the, like a spell section would have been in any book. So I guess that's, uh, that's, that's, fair. that's true. That's true. It is, I guess you, yeah, that's a good, that's a good comparison. It's the spell section of the, essentially the spell section of the, of the cow punchers book. Al, Alaka boom, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I cast gun on you. <laughs> and um, we touched about it a, a bit with uh, when you talked about like doing the back end, putting the books on Lulu and stuff like that. But like, I wanted to say once you're done with the writing, at some point you have to make it available to the public and you make to have people aware that the product exists. Mm. Did you have like any special strategy? You have the YouTube channel, you have like a, a kind of like a following, I guess, at this point yeah it's, it's weird people want to listen to me but whatever i'm not gonna say no but uh i think it i think what it helps is and people can see this is if you genuinely care about games and you talk mm -hmm. about games you know uh i try to generate as much goodwill as i can by just trying to be cool and talking about games and being like a, a chill guy like the guy you see here and the guy you see on my videos and whatnot like that's me it's not a it's not a persona like i'm just John talking about games, you know, and, and chatting with other nerds or, or arguing with them. Um, and so I, I, I don't know, I, I kind of built up the YouTube channel and the, and the Twitter account. And so it's, it's definitely given me like a, a megaphone, a small megaphone, but a megaphone nonetheless of like uh, getting, getting my stuff out there and my ideas out there. And it's been super helpful. Um, but for, yeah, for smaller people, like, you know, I, I'm not also not the kind of guy that wants to pull the ladder up behind me. So, like, if you're designing something cool and you want to like share it with me, uh, and and you want me you want me to, to talk about it, like I'll throw that out there to people. Like, tell me about it, and and I'll do it. I won't charge you for advertising or anything like that because I generally want to see, I want to see the hobby grow, um, and you know, I want to see, in particular, like independent creators grow as well, no matter what you're mm -hmm. doing. So. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're cool and you want and you're interested in that, like I'm I'm not against I'm not going to lower the ladder. I'm not going to pull up the ladder behind me. You know, mm -hmm. I don't I don't have no intention of doing that. So, 
Yeah. Cause I understand that some people don't have the platform that's built up to market their stuff, but they might have a really cool idea or a cool blog or a cool game or something like that, or a cool book. Um, you know, I'm all about it. Did you ever consider like the, or did you ever do, maybe you did, I don't, I don't know, like uh, consider like buying ad on YouTube or Facebook, those kind of thing. Uh, no, I've, you know? well, first of all, I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm not allowed to do ads on, on Facebook cause I've, my account's pretty restricted from too much shit posting back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that problem there. So that's just out of mm -hmm. the question. Um, and my, my, my Facebook is like non presence is non-existent. I'm not on there really. I have an account. I use it only to share pictures of my daughter with uh, friends and family, mm -hmm. uh, in a group, in a private group. Other than that, I don't use Facebook for anything else for Twitter. I don't know. I, I feel like I get enough organic reach and word of mouth that I don't need to pay for ads. Uh, it just doesn't seem like a cost I'm interested in quite yet. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know. I, I just sort of just, I make, I make stuff and I talk about it and hopefully people are listening and I, I just rely on word of mouth um, to, to get my stuff out there personally. Yeah. You never consider like doing a crowdfunding campaign uh, or I don't think you did, right? No, you didn't. I've not done a crowdfunding campaign, although I will probably do one for Makuhito because I want to have a really nice offset print of the book. Oh, like, nice. You know, uh, it mm. it's still going to go up on print on demand. Um, you can still be able to buy the PDF and everything. It'll pretty much be like once the book is done, I want to do a crowdfunding, pretty much taking pre-orders for like a nice offset print, a uh, hardcover version of the book, mm -hmm. you know, and, that, and that's it. No stretch goals, no nothing like that. Just do you want like a nice... Like I want to do like a foil embossed cover and stuff like that, you know, and nice pages and, and everything. So hmm. that's, that's my goal with that. Just keep it simple. <laughs> and is there a reason why you didn't go that route uh, before that you, did you just find like the, the, the too much work for what it was worth or? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I feel blessed in that I can do the art and I write and do the layout. Mm -hmm. I do everything myself. So most Kickstarters, like Vic had to do a Kickstarter because he wanted to pay for artists. You know, mm -hmm. that's generally what a lot of, most Kickstarters for games are going towards paying illustrators and artists because they're mm -hmm. expensive. But, you know, I never really needed to do that because I did everything myself. So there was no, there was no uh, costs that I was going to have to incur to pay for certain things because I could just do it all by myself. I could, write the book, do the layout, do the art and get it up on drive through RPG or Lulu, or now my website, which I can do print on demand from as well through Lulu. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's no, I, I, I don't have any middlemen. I don't have any, anything like that. That's in my way. Like if I wanted with Makuhito, if I didn't want to do a nice offset print, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do crowdfunding with it. I wouldn't need to, uh, I don't think, but because I want to do a nice, I really, for this book, cause it's very special to me. I want to do a nice offset print. So that's why I'm doing that route. It's not because I have artists to pay or editors to pay or anything like that. It's, it's purely because I want to give people like a nice quality book in their hand uh, with that, with that particular one. Mm. By the way, all the link to uh, John's website and products and uh, his Lulu page or his own website or his only fan, it's all down there in the description below. So you can, if you want to look at his product and you should, because it's good stuff, you can uh, look, you. It up, look it up there. Yeah. And you just to finish up on the Kickstarter thing or the, or the crowdfunding, I should say, because now there's more options at Kickstarter. Do you think that this uh, it would, could have like an impact on visibility as well, like kind of reach outside of the audience? Because a lot of people are gonna sometimes just browse Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's the other benefit of crowdfunding is that it does give you um, kind of a bullhorn a little bit, like you're on mm -hmm. a platform, and if and if people get that FOMO stuff with a lot yeah. of projects products too for instance i think like i, I give more power to uh kelsey from arcane library for shadow dark you know but she, yep. she marketed she marketed that game to perfection and it caused a lot of people to be like i gotta get in on whatever this new cool thing is mm -hmm. and you know uh more power to her as a capitalist i think it's great but uh she, but yeah I, I think crowdfunding could definitely work as a good like uh marketing strategy um, as well. I, I, for me though, like I'm only doing it for Makuhito because I want that nice offset print, the headache of dealing with questions for a month and the stress of it, I hear is like, it's probably going to give me some gray hairs, but, uh, it's, it's, 
up until this point, it's not seemed worth it to me, I guess. Even still, I'm sort of like, man, I really want that offset print, but you know, I really don't want to crowdfund because it seems like mm. a nightmare. But uh, you know, you, you're going to get rid of anyway. <laughs> Might as well get them for doing something worthwhile than just from waiting around. Yeah. So. yeah. What a... Um, you mentioned that you wanted you wanted to do that for Macquetal because this one is very special to you. What makes it so special? Is it because of the theme of the the, the theme? It's been something I've been interested in since I was a kid. You know, mm -hmm. my dad had like all of these uh, like Mexican musical artists and whatnot, and they always had like cool Aztec motifs on them on the covers mm -hmm. of their albums. I just remember these as a kid. I don't remember the bands, but I just remember I just remember this music as a kid. And so, and, and this, these album covers, and I've always been interested in, in, in that because it's, it's been part of my, you know, um, ethnicity, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, fa familial, familial history, at least half of it. So, uh, and, and this has been a, this Makuhito has been a project that I've worked on for like probably two, almost two and a half years now. Yeah. So it's probably the longest running game I've worked on. Like while I was doing cow punchers, I was doing this while I was, doing everything else i've been doing this so um it's it's been a long it's been a long process with it i've rewritten it like probably four or five times at this point because it wasn't where i wanted it to be uh and i'm finally happy with it now because it's it's pretty much done the text is pretty much done i'm just doing the layout and art at this point um but yeah i don't know it just i've, I've really enjoyed the process of creating it i think the setting is cool uh, I've had some some of the play testers in here. Matt here in chat is a, is a play tester, and some other people have play tested it, mm -hmm. uh, and they seem to be having a good time. I'm, I don't I don't think they're just being nice to me. So, <laughs> what you know, what makes you sorry? Oh no, I was saying, it's, it's just I've I've just enjoyed the process, and it's it's been a long time coming. So it's just I want to make this book like the book, like mm -hmm. Mike. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you rewritten it a few times because it wasn't what you... Do you want to expand a bit on that? What makes... Uh, when you look at it, you say like, oh, no, that's not it. That's not good. What like what was... Is there something that... Uh, it was just like not feeling right? Because you, you were already with the kind of like old school D&D &D rules for the project. You started like you... No. Yes. Yeah, so like a couple things. For instance, there's this might be heresy to some people, but there's no gold for XP in <laughs> uh, mostly because like the Aztecs didn't really care about that. Like that was something mm -hmm. very high nobility had access to the Aztecs ge generally traded in like cocoa beans and cloth. And so like going into a dungeon and uh, going into a dungeon and getting cocoa beans does not sound fun to me. <laughs> cocoa beans for XP. Yeah. So instead, like I, it was mostly just rewriting the, the advancement system. So instead I went for, there's no real XP. Instead, I call it status points. And status points uh, are, yeah, Jeff Rose right there. XP for gold could work for like the Cortez, uh, yep. for the, the, the Spanish. When I do that supplement, it will probably So if you want to do the cocoa bean for XP, it'd be like a Urshe, not Urshe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got that. That's funny. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that took a second. <laughs> Hershey. Oh yeah, Ch cocoa beans, chocolate. Um, but instead, gold gold for XP motivates players to get into the dungeon every single time and explore and risk life and limb in order to get that glory to advance. And so there's not really that in in Makuhito, but the Aztecs did. They were a warrior society, and the way you advanced in in military society with the Aztecs was to capture sacrificial victims and to capture slaves. So this is going to be controversial for people, but the way you advance in Makuhito is going to be fighting people and trying to take them alive for sacrifice or slaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I, and I give other tables for giving like points for uh, uh, like defending a city, raiding a village, doing during doing certain things like that will give you more uh, XP or status points. But also status points are expended on. Uh, advancing or on your gear or hirelings or anything like that. Like if you have to make a choice. So the XP thre leveling thresholds are a little bit lower for the Aztec character classes because they're going to be spending their, um, they're going to be spending their XP or, or status points as I call them on hirelings, on gear, on doing, uh, cr building a temple or um, a fort or something like that, or, uh, or for leveling up their characters, which as they level up, it's going to get more and more expensive to get to that higher tier. So 
um, that was the the problem that was that was the thing that was becoming a problem for me design wise was like how do I make this work because everything else was working really well with like mm -hmm. the, the white box style rules, um, but that was that was one thing where it was a little bit of a holdup. So that's that's what I want with with that. I'm still motivating players to get out there and like find artifacts. You'll get you'll get status points for finding artifacts and for raiding and looting, but also for like capturing sacrificial victims alive and and using them uh for rituals and stuff like that so uh to me like the advancement system had to motivate players to engage with the setting and with the cultural stuff going on in the aztec society so that's what i was trying to do hmm. so and we talked a bit about it a bit uh, earlier but you mentioned that uh, it was a team that you wanted to explore because like well first it's a, it's a team that hasn't been explored much at all but also like you because you're of a Mexican origin, you are, you have this linkage to your heritage, mm. and we've seen other people like uh, make game or market game based on their heritage uh, lately in some way that were sometimes uh, almost ex exclusionary. You'd say like saying, "Oh, you cannot play this game if you're not." Uh, <laughs> there's not going to be none of that with uh, Macquarie. Oh, of course, of course not. <laughs> Max, you can play. You can play Makuhito. You can be a Jaguar warrior. I encourage it. It'll, it'll be great. So, <laughs> no, I do not care about that. Like that's that's all just BS to me. It's a fantasy game. It's for fun, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I don't care. I, I figured if anyone's going to do it, like I should be the one to do it too. You know, it's a setting that's not been explored. I'm yep. interested in it. I'm passionate about it. And if someone should be able to get away, if if we're going to play by these, like you have to be of that ethnicity to make it rules like i should be the one to make it but i'm not going to necessarily make it by their rules like it's going to be true to form um you know like i have a whole section for instance in the book on on women in aztec culture like the women can only be certain classes in the game there's not going to be female jaguar warriors there's not going to be female eagle warriors there's not going to be female otomi mercenaries or shorn ones because those didn't exist mm -hmm. like you could be a female merchant or a female priestess that's pretty much it and I'm going to probably get flack for that, but to me, it seems disingenuous and and um, to the to the Aztec culture and history to be like oh, to to superimpose our 21st century values onto them that were existing in like 1376, you know, AD, to and and to pretend like they were as progressive as we are now, like, like that's not the case at all. And people can deal with that if they want. Like I'm not I'm not changing that. I'm not bending to that at all. So. Yeah so when you, you the way you approach the game also like because it's going to be in a way a fantasy game but you also try to keep it like very grounded into uh, mm. a near circle context i guess yes it's it's like it's like what if the as it's aztec historical aztec society but like magic is real and the mm -hmm. monsters of myth are out there in the in the plains and in the highlands and the jungles and whatnot yeah. and and uh, magic as they see it, they see it themselves i guess yes yeah it's mm -hmm. it's like explicitly real um mm -hmm. and, and uh you know when when the when the conquistadors will come eventually i'm gonna i am gonna do that supplement uh, after the game releases like it'll be like what if that was you know that like what what if the mysticism of both sides was like dialed up to like 11 but everything mm -hmm. else was historically accurate that's been kind of my goal with it. The only thing I'm dialing up, the only thing I'm changing is like the level of of magic and mysticism, making it a little bit more fantastical. Otherwise, it's 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 historical. So we got like a comment there for you. She since the your game is about sacrificing people for X space status, then you can make the iconography for a sacrifice ripped art. The cover could be an Aztec and holding a rip art. For the for right now, the cover I have is the Aztec calendar because the calendar is an important part of the game. Um, so character creation in this is um, based on the Aztec zodiac. So you're born within. There's a 260 day sacred calendar. They had two calendars, and this is why I've had to use uh, the, the Broasar method of timekeeping because it's just easier to market like on each day. So they had a 260 day calendar. They had a 365 day calendar that was like an 18 month calendar or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two were interlocked. Every 52 years was considered a, an Aztec like new century or something like that. Because that's when those two calendars would sync up and then they'd go out of sync again. Another 52 years would happen, they'd sync up again. On the sacred calendar, there's like 20 uh, phases or they're called uh, tresenias. And they would 
the uh, they're different zodiac signs, and the Aztecs believed like you were born. What you, your your fate was determined by the zodiac sign you were born under. Like some of them are terrible. Like, uh, and I implement it with it mechanically in the game, where if you're born under this certain sign, you're doomed to slavery and sacrifice. So if you mm. get captured, you're gonna have massive penalties to trying to escape, you know, or something like that. Um, so it wasn't based on the on on your family lineage. It was based on the date. Like, so you you could be born from some a priest or whatever, and but like, oh, you're yeah. born that day just tough luck yeah pretty much parents had so and i and i make this a rule but parents could wait four days uh sorry four days to name their child uh because it was on the day you were named oh so you were born on a certain day if it was a bad sign parents could wait up to four days in order to name their child and so i have that mechanically as like a sort of you know your, the parents of aztecs could do that you as a player can do that as well if you get like an unfortunate uh uh, an unfortunate zodiac sign there is the potential that you might be able to wait four days and add uh, and end up on a good day mm -hmm. um and they also believed in obviously sacred numbers so you know certain numbers were boons and soon certain numbers were days so like if you were born on day 10 of the cycle that might be good but if you're born on day 12 well i don't know tough luck buddy you're gonna have some problems so there's their, your character's stats and um certain aspects of the of who they are will be affected by their zodiac sign and the day they're born on the number the numerical day they're born on and then you get into picking your classes and stuff like that so so again it's a very old school feel of like we roll for your character creation yes so not only are you rolling for attributes uh you're you're, you're rolling for like the day you were born on the day you're named on and the number that you were born on and like how lucky or unlucky that is and you might some of them again i i make them purposely pretty terrible because the aztecs believe that um, you know, but it's, it's part of the game. And I, I think it's an important part of like keeping that, uh, theme or authenticity in the, in the game as well. I think it's a very interesting approach that you have to look for this authenticity because basically you're exposing the setting to people that might have heard about it through fiction and stuff like that. But if you, when you give an approach that's more authentic in a way, it's almost <laughs> say educational educational to some point sure. to some extent uh, i do think someone could i do think someone could play the game and learn something about aztec mm -hmm. culture and society playing the game that's also a goal you know but again i'm not sugarcoating it they that i wouldn't want to live in their society it was terrible but but that's the thing if you if you were to sugarcoat it then you would lose this uh, this educational aspect it, yeah you just become like another hollywood uh you know depiction of a uh, with rose tinted glasses because we don't want to offend nobody yeah no, i'm not intending to do that so and I, and i think like again do, this is the importance of research and why i enjoy doing research we talked about research earlier when i'm doing this like historical research i find it interesting because i'm looking at these historical things like the aztecs did and how can i make these game mechanics because mm. that's because making these cultural aztec things game mechanics is what's going to make the game feel like it's an aztec themed game like it's not just a pure like Oh, it's not like I just took the the thief class and mm -hmm. redid it as a as an eagle warrior, you know. Like there's real, there's a real feeling of of difference to it that it's in it, that it's fresh and different because it is like you're doing real authentic research to try and mine it for game mechanics, and I think that's important. Yep, I think it's a no. I, re, I it's a very interesting approach, and I'll be definitely looking that one because like. You know, I'm not the biggest OSR guy because I often say, like, you know what? It, oftentimes, it just seems like, oh, it's just like an, uh, the same game with a slightly different setting and stuff like that. The way you do it, because you and you were mentioning, oh, I don't want to rewrite BX or ODND over and over again. But now, like, if you take it and you basically re remelt it in something that is new and that is very different, now mm. you're giving it a new life. Yeah, and that's the goal. That's, that's I hope I accomplish it. So far, people seem happy with it, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Do you have any? Because like we talk on the in the beginning, like about every other GM out there got like this some either a setting or a system or something they would like to put out. Sometimes they've been working on them for years and years. Any? Do you have any advice for them to go from having an idea? having something you're working on to actually have something that is out there that people can consume. Um, yeah, you, you just gotta, you gotta set realistic goals for yourself. Um, 
so for instance i i did uh cow punchers because the first version which was like a little like a zine side it's, it's like 24 pages the original mm-hmm. rules um which you can run that game i did like just fine as, as a complete game in itself in and of itself but i wanted to expand on it but i i started with something simple that i knew i could do so for an aspiring person maybe it's a class maybe it's just an adventure um uh, maybe it's a map maybe it's like a book of random tables or something like that or or something like something where you know that you're going to get it done because then once you get that under your belt like like you know you can do it and mm-hmm. you can try something a little more difficult again next and then a little more difficult after that i really think that most people need to slowly ramp up if they're trying to to do this kind of stuff just going out and being like i've never done this before and i'm going to i'm going to go write a 250 page rule book for an entirely new game system um sure someone can do that but you you whoever you are out there listening or watching you probably won't do that i'm sorry to say like you're probably going to burn out and you're not going to finish it Mm -hmm. So start small, build up, build it up, get the kinks out of your creative process on small, manageable projects, and then slowly build up to something increasingly more ambitious things. And you'll probably be more successful than if you're just like right out the gate, I'm going to write like a huge book, you know? Um, So yeah, Mm -hmm. start small, ramp it up slowly. We got a question here. Somebody asked, do you work the Aztec cannibalism into the magic system? Uh, Yes. So there is a higher level spell, for instance, that uh, is a Zipek Totec uh, uh, ritual. So the Aztecs, when they worship that god, he's he's called the flayed god. Uh, They'd flay the skin of the sacrificial victim and wear the skin until it stank. So... uh, that is a high level spell that a a priest and a Noah Holly character can do in order to make like a special sort of temporary magical armor that um uh increases the character's ac pretty much or improves their ac for a limited amount of time until the the flayed skin becomes flaked and smelly and they can't wear it anymore um there are some spells that will that do involve cannibalism but Cannibalism was something that the Aztecs only, only really like the higher ups could really, uh, could only really do because it was something more the priestly class and those directly involved in the rituals would do was, it was part of that ritual religious aspect. So, um, it, it's going to, that kind of stuff is more like, you know, no, no Holly character has leveled up to like level seven, eight or nine or 10. He's like doing domain stuff and he has his own temple and he's doing sacrifices for the city that he's, you know, has his temple in. And uh, he, he's the head honcho in, in that religious uh, regard. So, um, yeah, it, it's good. That the, the earlier spells are a little more grounded and like basic and then they slowly, my goal is to slowly have them ramp up to be more um, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, a little macabre almost. Yeah. John uh, and Jonathan Rock ask, how hard do you work on bringing DMs and players into the milieu that they may know little about before playing? I guess exposing the setting, I guess that would be what he's asking about. Sure. Uh, I In Makuhito, I try and give as much information as I can without making it too much like a history book. But um, I, I try and give GMs enough in there so they know, so they can relate to their players. And in a game like makuhito or you're doing something weird like that where it's kind of very foreign and alien to most western peoples it's still alien to me and i've been doing lots of research about it uh it's i in my opinion it's okay for them to make mistakes as players and for you as a gm to correct them and be like oh well you know actually within society you wouldn't be able to do that you know um it's it, it you would actually probably think this instead and my players ask good questions during the play test because you know they're they're uh only one of them is pretty well versed in mesoamerican history and whatnot and, and even he will ask questions or it, it's it's actually forced people in, in our play group to like look things up uh, on their own actually and be like well what would my character do um they've really started to kind of take ownership of it so i i guess i haven't ran into that problem yet as well but uh, just explaining to them like these are the basics of what your character is about or would be about within society their place in society uh I, I try and give them the bare basics and then let them kind of discover it from there uh either through the game itself and role playing or if they ask a question I'll, i will generally tell them like this is what your character would probably know and how 
th- th- this is how they would understand it as their place in society, I guess. Hmm. So, do, do you have like a lore section kind of like establishing the basic in the book uh, itself? Yeah, there's a, there's going to be a whole section in Makuhito about like Aztec society. I go through most of the major gods. I go through like religious rituals, different kinds of sacrifices, uh, law, um, what, uh, what again, what the gender roles, roles were, uh, economics, how the tribute system worked, even down to like how a warrior uh, was able to attain their rations when they would go on military marches. I give because it, it, there's a specific way that the Aztecs did that as well, um, and and how they're able to con- conquer so much of the Valley of Mexico so quickly. Uh, was was through their tribute system and through how they supplied um, supplies to their army and their soldiers. So, like, I, I try and give as much as I can in that, and so GMs can read that, referees can read that, and will I think have enough information to make uh, the the setting feel right for the players and the players to f- jump in pretty easily. So, mm. there's something I want to address if you don't mind, like uh, this uh, Guardian of the Rune here. Say, I thought you didn't care about setting, Max, and it's true. I talked a lot about that. I don't usually care about setting, but somehow when you come to when John comes later with a historical setting and one that I don't I don't know much about, the fact that is that is a uh, historical and like somewhat like base that try to be authentic make me feel like it's worthwhile to learn about because i'm i'm interested in history and stuff like that <laughs> when people come with fantastical setting and that are go outside the trope but just change stuff slightly and they don't make much sense and then i don't get so so much uh, so invested in it so i guess uh I think I think it's a very it's a great idea to go with the historical setting. Whoops, sorry, with a historical setting like that that the um, that is unknown to most people because then it uh, it it kind of uh, gives me the little extra push of motivation on inv- investing myself in learning a setting instead of just making my own. When uh, do you have like a, an estimated date when you think this is gonna be done? Because you're pretty in the last last stretch here, right? Yeah, it's just it's the hard part of like getting some of the editing out of the way, and um, I'm getting feedback from my players still, and editing from the players as well as they kind of dig into the rule book as I have it now. Um, I'm I'm getting into the home stretch. I'm shooting for before like fall. Um, I was shooting for the end of summer, but I'm not sure if I can if I can do that, like if I can get it some point in fall, I don't want to compete with Christmas. If it goes over to Christmas, I'm probably going to wait till like spring next year, unfortunately, because I don't want to just, I don't want to do a, a, a crowdsourcing campaign during Christmas. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it, it, if it, if worse comes to worse spring next year, ideally uh, some point in the fall at the latest, uh, but it, who knows? So <laughs> Are you going to try to, uh, set the launch on the lucky day um you know I, that would be funny if i did i should i should look to do that i there's a there's a aztec calendar.com i believe i should i should look ahead and see what what a lucky day would be so <laughs> <laughs> guardian of the rune ask uh, did lion and dragon give you any confidence that a strongly historic historic game could do well because that's oftentimes the other game people think about when they think about uh authentic historic game uh, somewhat. I mean, I, I I own Lion and Dragon. It's it's a it's a decent game. It's good. Uh, I, I've not had a chance to actually run it yet because I'm I'm so invested in like regular. I'm still I'm still obsessed with uh, you know traditional TSR era D and D. Um, but yeah, I mean that's part of it. But I mean, Pendragon has also been a bit in, big influence on me as well. And Pendragon, mm-hmm. uh, I've not really played Pendragon, but I own Second Edition and I've read it. And uh, it's it's that that was something that's somewhat historically or like somewhat historically grounded and based, you know, or attempting to be in that vibe, that that sphere, that feeling. And that that game's well beloved and liked. I mean, mm-hmm. there's lots of games in the past that have done it. I just think it is a smaller niche market because people really love their their high fantasy, you know, animal people, tiefling stuff, but. Uh, you know, I think there's a place for this kind of stuff too, and and so I don't know. I, I, I make things too, but I don't really care if they're marketable or not. 
I make things mm -hmm. that I want to make. Like I said earlier, like people said I was stupid for doing, um, uh, for doing cow punchers and not making it weird West. And I'm like, but I don't like weird West. I want just a regular, I want to be like the man with no name. I want to be like Clint Eastwood in one of the dollar trilogy films, you know, where it's very grounded and I'm not shooting zombies and vampires and monsters. Like I'm just shooting other cowboys. I'm shooting bandits and stuff like, so I, I don't make things if it's going to be necessarily successful. If it's successful, great. Uh, but I, I just make things I care about. So, so I'm not too concerned movie about that. Wasn't the, the Will Smith movie wasn't a big influence. The what? The Will Smith movie wasn't a big influence. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not quite interested in that. <laughs> yeah. I know other people are, and some people have taken Cow Punchers and done Weird West with it, and I mm -hmm. fully support that. But for me personally, that wasn't my, my goal with it. You, know? you can do it with it, but that wasn't my goal. So. That's something we can talk about as well, because like... Uh, you have been somewhat impacted by the when the OGL scandal like came about mm -hmm. uh, that kind of pushed you to to uh, do you like rework the atomic punk atomic punk uh, mm -hmm. what uh, what if somebody wants to do something with your game exactly like if you, if I want to make a supplement for Cow Puncher how do you go about it if somebody would were to ask you if somebody want to make a Dutch expansion for uh, <laughs> Macuto <laughs> Uh, so, so cow punchers is in the creative commons. It's in the creative commons by, uh, share alike. So as long mm -hmm. as you share it under the same one and you credit the original, um, you can do whatever you want with it. You can make your own game. You can make a supplement. Like I, I, I can't stop you as long as you're following the rules of the CCBYSA. uh, for atomic punk, I released an SRD. It's on my website. It's on drive through RPG. Uh, it is like a stripped down artless version essentially of atomic punk, but it is, uh, in the public domain. So you don't even have to give me credit. You can just do mm. it. And then the logo for the 2d 10 system is in the, in the creative commons, uh, as well, just like cow puncher. So you could slap the 2d 10, you can use the atomic punk system on there and make whatever you want. And I can't stop you. I won't stop you. I have no intention of stopping you. And the same goes for cow punchers. So for Makuhito, I'm not sure what i'm going to look into different licensing things that i could potentially do because i do want to encourage other people to make stuff for it if they want mm -hmm. you know I'm all, I'm all about that so that's why i've done all my other stuff in a similar vein um whether that's going to be creative commons or something else i'm not sure yet but I'll, i'll figure that out when i get there it'll be similarly like uh open and free for people to 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 do what they want with and and feel confident that you know it's going to be uh they're, they're going to be protected <laughs> and not, I'm not going to come after them. I have no intention of doing that. <laughs> We're uh, coming up on the hour and a half now. Do you have like any uh, advice you would give to somebody that wants like, oh, oh we, we touched that already. Uh, what I want to ask, sorry, we touched that already. What I want to ask uh, in the end, like is what, is there like another setting or another theme that you, is in the back of your mind that sometime you would uh, like to work on? What's what's up for the future? Oh, uh, yeah. Language? Oh yeah. So after Makuhito, I, I really want to, uh, Crossface mentioned it in the chat. He's, he calls it snake punchers, yeah. but, uh, I want, I, I have been working on, on and off in the background, uh, on, uh, applying the cow punchers rules to, um, a fantasy sort of setting, mm -hmm. but the more I work on it, the more modified it becomes. And it's starting to drift further and further away from like, a, directly being related to cow punchers so we'll see how it goes but I'm, i want to do that i want to do like a because you know chaosium has kind of become like a you know they're, they're starting to pander a little bit i'd like to compete yeah. with them so uh I, i might do a i've talked with victor gorchev about this maybe doing like a call of cthulhu style like a lovecraftian horror game mm -hmm. um using maybe the cow punchers rules or something yeah. like that you know i think that'd be fun and people would like that Give people an alternative if they're a little turned off by some of the stuff going on. Um, so <laughs> Zolian says I should call it Snake Stranglers. I'm calling it Blades of Devil Tree. It, it doesn't have a uh, it doesn't have a catchy puncher title to it. I thought about doing that. Maybe maybe I will change the name. I'm not sure, but um, I couldn't think of anything fun that was like cow punchers that was similar in 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 the vein. I guess. <laughs> Where did the name cow, pun cow puncher come from? Cow, cow punchers is just another term for cowboy. So oh, really, I've never heard that before. But like, yeah, I'm, I'm not a English, not my first language. So yeah, it's just it's another slang term that was used for for 
for uh, range hands and cowboys back in the day. So hmm. Hmm. I just thought it was a funny term. And it, obviously the name is ev evocative. People love, think it's hilarious. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, there's like this uh, action feel to it. You know, it's like, yeah. Because of, yeah. Do you have any other word of insight you'd like to share with us before we uh, wrap this up here? Yeah, you know, there's been a lot of uh, stuff going on about like labels and stuff like that. And I just want to tell people like game how you what you want and what you enjoy. And, you know, um, it's don't be beholden to labels. If people try and put you in a box, that's just their own small minded thinking. So, you know, do what you want. <laughs> that's my that's my uh, little advice there, I guess. <laughs> All right. I want to thank you very much, John, for joining me. It was a uh... Very interesting talk. Like, like I, I like having all those uh, perspective from people coming at in the creation process from different pers from different way. Uh, thanks for having so, me on. It was a pleasure, and thank you for everybody that joined us, for the people that was active in chat, for people that watch later on on the video on demand. And next week, uh, I'm gonna have like um, still need to be confirmed. I think I'm gonna have Paddy's from Paddy's Parlor that also put the uh, products out. So we're gonna talk about his creative process and is uh, the way he approach uh, game creation. And then, so I hope you're gonna join us then as well. And I'll see you also this week uh, during the the stream I do during the week. John has a stream on Monday, mm -hmm. uh, Natural One on Natural his channel. One. All the links are in the description below. Make sure to check uh, John's product, check John's website and YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. <laughs> I assume most of you did. <laughs> we we kind of run the same circle. So. Yeah, it's all, it's all good though. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much, John, for joining me once again. And uh, well, I'll see you around. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you.